Hello, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Arna Sahu, host of Arna's News, where on this podcast channel, I aim to eliminate the gender gap in the STEM fields by featuring inspiring female professionals and highlighting their stories and accomplishments to further encourage girls. Today on episode 28, I am pleased to announce our guest, Dr. Jennifer Haley. As a board-certified dermatologist, Dr. Taylor has successfully run a business and enjoys collaborating with like-minded, driven, and creative individuals on various innovative projects. Currently working at Apple as a dermatologist consultant, she's also worked with multiple global Fortune 500 companies as a consultant and is licensed in Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Illinois, Maryland, New Jersey, New Hampshire, North Carolina, New York, Nevada, Tennessee, Utah, Virginia, Vermont, and Washington. Her passions include the integration of health, skincare, fitness, nutrition, and environmental well-being. So thank you so much, Dr. Haley, for being here today. Before we dive into the questions, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, No, I think you did a great job of introducing me. So we can just jump right in and give your audience some good information. All right. So my first question for you is tell us a bit about your career path. Sure. So I come from the mindset of um, being open to opportunities. So I've always been a planner. So even before, you know, each grade in high school, I'd open up the yearbook and plan out what extracurriculars I wanted to do the next year and what, you know, grades I, you know, what classes I wanted to do and things like that. And I've discovered over the last 51 years of my life that the best the best gifts in life are often not planned. So you have to be receptive to opportunities. So I grew up in a very poor household where my parents were just trying to make ends meet. And I noticed that I got a lot of praise at school for getting good grades. So that reinforced me getting good grades and biology in particular, I had a good mentor and a great teacher. And I fell in love with the fact that we can, we can modify our behavior to affect our biology. And when I studied medicine in the beginning, basically I was told your genetics determined your life. And now we know the opposite. There's this beautiful part of science called epigenetics, which basically is that 90%, 80 to 90%, I like to think 90%, 90% of your environment, your exposure to different things determines your health, your life, your everything. And I like to think of that in every way, especially in America, I feel very blessed to grow up here because as a woman, we have opportunity to do anything we want, anything we want. And the only limitation is what our head allows us to do. So I believe that if I you know, lost my career tomorrow, I would be able to build an entire new career. So as long as you have that mindset of being able to you know, pivot and come up with you know, new strategies, you can certainly do anything you want in your life. And I started off being a clinician. I was in the Navy for 15 years. I accidentally went in the military. It wasn't a planned thing. It was, it was a surprise and it was a gift because I didn't have any debt after going in the military for my medical training for undergrad. I went to Cornell and I paid for that, but, um, I worked in a clinic for a while and then slowly and slowly, I just started working for other companies, whether they were a startup company or a big company like Apple or Google, just working as a consultant. And then I stepped out of clinical medicine and now I do what most people don't think of a doctor doing. So nothing's permanent. Always be open to new opportunities, be creative in your mindset. And, um, you don't need to do what other people want to define you as you get to do what you want. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I love the way that you said how women have so many more opportunities. And I'm so glad you enlightened us with that. It's true. It's really true. I mean, your only limitation is your mind. Like, look at you. I don't even know how old you are, but like, you're amazing. You have a podcast. Like, that's just, I mean, it, it's a great platform. You, you can really do anything you want in this world. Just, just know that. It's, the only limitation is what we tell ourselves. Yes, that is very, very true. All right. My next question is what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a similar career to yours? And do you have any tips to succeed? Sure. Um, Well, my career isn't really, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's changed quite a bit over time. So if someone wants to be a doctor, 
I mean, you just have to work hard and get the boring foundation. Do I remember any organic chemistry? Probably not, but you have to, what I tell my kids is you kind of have to play the game to get to where you want to be. So, um, it takes discipline and I, I highly value discipline in all aspects. Um, Okay. So here's a good example. So when I was interviewing for medical school, I had some great interviews and I had some jerks, right? Cause you're always going to come across jerky people. Right. And typically when people are in a bad mood, there's a beautiful book called the four agreements. And one of the agreements in the four agreements states, don't take anything personally because it's never about you. So when someone's in a bad mood, it usually is because they're mad at you. It's because maybe their body hurts. Maybe they got in a fight with someone. Maybe they they lost their job. You never know what's going on. So you can't really take these things personally. And the man who interviewed me, he said to me, and this is my first choice med school. He says, well, what happens when you don't get in? And I thought, oh gosh, what a weird question. Like, that sounds kind of awful. Like I'm not going to get in. Like I made the assumption I'm not going to get in. Right. <clears throat> so I thought about it and I said, well, then I'll figure out why I'll fix it and I'll reapply next year because this is the only thing I ever want to do with my life. So if there's really only one thing that you want to do with your life, there's always a way and life is not in a straight line. So there are people who, you know, maybe they have drug addictions or maybe they didn't grow up with money and they can't go to college until they're 28, but they still end up getting to be a doctor. You don't have to be a doctor by going to school when you're 18 to go to college and then 21 when you're in medical school. You you can have other pathways and other avenues and not take a direct line and have those experiences that then make you maybe more empathic and more understanding and and you know better at caring and healing people. So um first of all just check in with yourself. I think the most important thing nowadays is checking in with yourself and sitting with yourself and seeing what do you really want to do? What brings you joy every day? Not what other people want you to do. And that might change and it's okay if it changes, you know, the average person has seven careers and that's the fun of life is, you know, just changing and doing new things and bringing what you learned into new activities. So, you know, first of all, check in with what you want to do. Um, have a lot of grit. <laughs> Don't give up. Even though times are hard, surround yourself with a community of supportive people. So having people that are like-minded are going to be like you. So if you want to be healthy, you need to surround yourself with people who are healthy. If you want to be academic, you need to surround yourself with people that are going to promote your academics. So having a healthy community that's going to support you, because there were times where I wanted to quit medical school and I had friends, they said, just get through and get your MD. And then you could be a writer like Michael Crichton and write books or something. And I said, okay, I just have two more years of that. I don't have to think about six more years with residency. And then I got through it and I like loved residency because it wasn't so in the books, you know? So, I mean, just stick with it and, and make sure it's what you want to do and you'll find joy and you'll, you'll make it happen. I think there's absolutely a hundred percent of a way of making it happen. If it's something that you want to do. I totally agree. My parents actually tell me that the five people that you surround yourself with are going to probably shape who you're going to be in the next few years. So being around those people that you want to be like is very important. Yes. And the other thing is, is I think sometimes, you know, when you're young, you have your friends, right? And as you get older, your, your character, your preferences in life, your goals might change and you might have to change some friends in order to do that. So don't, it, it's kind of sad, but it's also happy. So be grateful for the friendships that you've had because they were, everything is a gift and those people are a gift, but you're not always aligned. It's sort of like, I'm not a physics person, but a microwave and a radio wave, they're both important, but they don't intersect, right? They're doing two separate things. And that's how it is with people. And then sometimes you can have really good friends in high school. And then for me, like some of my friends I didn't talk to for 20 years and now we're great friends again. So a life, life happens that way. And it's, you know, you don't want to use people like in a Machiavellian way, like pawns in your life, but it's just sort of where you're aligned with at the moment tends to draw those people in more energetically and, and more consistently. And I mean, I just want to go back with, you have to check in with yourself and make sure that you follow your heart and everything with you do, because I think as women, we tend to be pleasers and we want to please other people and get approval and, you know, kindness is great but not at the compromise of your heart and your soul. So like I have a little thing next to my bed saying, um, consider others, prioritize yourself because I had to learn that because I, I lived for other people. So if I was looking back at my own 17 year old self, that's what I would say. 
Yeah, I think that's very true. I mean, I'm a people pleaser, so I definitely feel that. So just being honest with yourself and understanding what you want to do is very important. For sure. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. My next question is, what is a common myth about your profession that you want to debunk? Okay. This is great. So, <laughs> okay. So I first wanted to be a veterinarian. So I went to Cornell because I have a really good vet school and then they made us work on the farm. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know how to work on the farm. I, I just like dogs. So then I said, I don't think I really want to be a veterinarian. So it was my, between my freshman and sophomore year, I said, I think I'll go to medical school now. So then I changed my courses. It was very stressful. It really, in retrospect, didn't have to be stressful, but it was to me, I made it stressful. And, um, so just tell yourself to chill out a little bit. And if, if you're going through that, cause it's going to be okay. And then I was a pediatrician. I wanted to be a pediatrician. I love kids. I, I wanted to advocate for kids. And, um, I, when I do something, I'm extremely intense. So I went to medical school and I was the president of the pediatric society and all of that. And everyone in the class was like, Oh, if you want to know anything about peds, go ask Jen. She knows everything about peds. Right. So then of course, in my third year of medical school, where you're starting to try to match with, you know, your residency and your internship one afternoon, and I'm coming back around to the myth one afternoon, they said in my pediatric rotation, you need to do a specialty today, either cardiology or dermatology. And I was like, Oh, Ugh, I hate cardiology. I'm like, I guess I'll do dermatology. It's not even like it's a real doctor. So, <laughs> so I think that a lot of people think dermatology is like an esthetician or someone who does facials and it's completely not the way it is. So I went to dermatology that afternoon and I completely fell in love with it because I realized that you can look at the skin, which is the largest visible organ of the body. So if you imagine blood flow goes to every organ. So the organ that's feeding the blood flow to my face or to grow our hair or to grow our nails is also perfusing, giving blood flow to our heart, our kidneys, our lung, our lungs, all the organs, right? So if we're breaking out on our face, if we're having rashes, if we're having inflammation, if we're having all sorts of different diseases on the skin, it's actually just a clue. It's like Sherlock Holmes of what's going on inside the body. So that's why I fell in love with dermatology. And it's, it's a lot deeper and more, more academic and intense than I thought. It's one of the hardest specialties to get into actually. So I'm glad I studied hard, but, but it's not just like giving facials or doing Botox. It's actually looking at areas of the body to get clues as to what's going on inside somebody's health. So that's, that's why I like it. But that is, that is one of the biggest fallacies is that we're just like pimple poppers, <laughs> which we are, but <laughs> we do other things too. Yeah. I think that's important getting out of your comfort zone and doing things that you probably wouldn't normally do because I'm a very stubborn person and I don't like trying new things, but when I do get exposed to other things, I actually kind of fall in love with them. So, right. It's just being open-minded, you know, and not having an absolute mindset and realizing the world is gray. It's not black and white. There's not this or that. There's just, you know, perspectives on things really. Yeah. There's okay. something for everyone. There's something for everyone. That's the beauty of it. You know, it's a matter of what matches you. Yeah, that is true. There's always something for everybody. Yes. Okay. And my next question is, if you could step into my shoes or your younger self, what would you have asked yourself that I may have not asked myself? What would I have asked? How old are you again? I'm sorry. Um, I'm a high schooler. Okay. Okay. So gosh, let's see. I have two high schoolers. What would I have asked? Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, ask is hard versus tell, you know, you want to give advice to your younger self. What would I have asked? Um, I would have asked, are you doing this for the right reasons? You know, why, why are you making these decisions? I think I would, I would have asked before I made so many decisions, are you trying to do this to prove something to someone? Or are you doing it because it brings you joy? Um, yeah. Or do you, are you doing it just to build your resume, which you have to do those things? You know, you, you do have to do some degree of things. There is a fine line between living a life because it brings you joy and, it, and, and the energy brings more joy to others because you're doing it from a place of joy versus if you're doing something with resentment or obligation, it's not bringing the same amount of joy and gifts to others. So if we all follow a life where 
we're doing something that brings us joy, it actually emanates this, this, this different type of energy to the world that makes them receive it better. And I think it, it kind of shares the love, you know, it's like, if I was here on the podcast, like, oh, I have to say I did this podcast with a high schooler, you know, versus like, oh, she seems really interesting to talk to. I'm like excited to share information. It's, it's a very different type of energy that goes through the world. And we all feel it, whether we're at the checkout place or whether we, you know, pass someone, you know, or something like that. So I would have, I would have asked myself, like, why are you doing this? What's, what's behind it? And is it something that uh, matches with your heart? Yeah, I think that's very true because as a student, you're always, a lot of people think that you should be doing this, 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 like you're supposed to have a to-do list, um, like a whole laundry list of things you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But if you actually do something that you truly enjoy, uh, your life won't be that miserable. Um, And you'll still get everything done. Yeah, Yeah. and you'll still do it all. Yeah, and I think I call it like living in the should world. Like I lived in the should world for so long. Like I should, I should do this. I should do that. I should do this. And then I'm like, what do I really want here? You know, like what? And then what happens is you do all these things thinking other people want you to do them, but then you resent them for it and they didn't even ask for it. So just check in with yourself, you know? Yeah. That's going back That's, to the check in. Yeah. I mean, I, I always had a lot of discipline and stuff. I didn't, I don't know what else I would ask myself. That's a good question. That's a really good question. I'll probably wake up at 3 AM coming up with a different answer. <laughs> Okay. My next question is what are the best resources slash books that have helped you find your career path? Well, I'm really old. So we actually had books back then. Um, you know what? It wasn't really books. It's more people. So I find that things happen a little serendipitously. And if you're not so hyper focus and channel vision, you actually open up to other things. So for me, I got into the military. I'll give you this example. And this is a great example. Um, I went to Cornell undergrad. I was, you know, I really wanted to go to Cornell and I went there and I get a little seasonal affective disorder. Where are you? Where are you located? Uh, San Jose. Okay. So you have nice weather, but upstate New York is very, very dark very cold. You, you know, you get really, really dark winters. So I get seasonal effective, kind of like a little depression from the lack of sun. So after medical school, I said to myself, I need to go to college. I need to go. I mean, after, after college, I said, I need to go to medical school somewhere warmer. So I basically drew a line, Maryland and South across the U S and I called every school on the AMCAS, which is the, the list of medical schools. And I said, do you accept out-of-state residents? Because every primary application I had, I sent was like $40, which was a lot of money back then. And I didn't want to send, I didn't want to send an application to like a university of California school when they only accepted 1% out-of-state residents. Right. So I called all these schools and there was basically five schools I could apply to that weren't state schools that would accept out-of-state residents that were in warmer places. It was like Emory, Tulane, U of A, because I was in Arizona then. And this other school, I never heard of it's in Bethesda, Maryland, the F. Edward A. Bear School of Medicine. I called, do you accept out of state residents? Oh, yes, we accept people of all colors, all sizes, all shapes, and you know, blah, blah, blah. Very political answer, right? So I checked the box. I had no idea of this school. Then I get an application. It's like really, really thick, like a deck of cards thick. I said, what is this? It's they want my fingerprints. They want uh, security clearance. I read it. I go, I could travel. I could dive. I could fly. I go, this is great. I could, oh, I don't even have to pay for medical school. I'm like, okay, well I, and the application's free. So (laughs) I was really poor. So I said the application's free. So I filled it out, got my fingerprints and everything. And it was, it was through the military. It was in medical school through the military. So I just said, let me just see, I'm, I can do exercise, you know, (laughs) and I went there and I saw people collaborating. It wasn't like undergrad where everybody was very competitive with each other. Everyone was collaborating and it was really a warm environment. And I just said, I guess I could do this. I'm going to just do this next application. So then I did the interview and I liked it. And then I got in (laughs) and then it even gets funnier. So then they said, okay, do you want army, Navy, air force, or public health service? And I knew nothing about the military. I just knew my friend in college was in the Navy and he lived in San Diego and I always wanted to live in San Diego. So I picked the Navy so I could hopefully eventually go to San Diego. So that's, that's where I'm going with this is like, 
you'll have these opportunities that the universe, God, whatever you believe in kind of brings upon you. And you're either going to open a door to it, or you're not going to open a door to it. So there's a lot of gifts coming to all of us every day, right? Like you probably interact with people that maybe you can call in five years and say, Hey, can you recommend something, you know, or whatever? Like you just have friends and you interact with people. Everyone wants to help you. Everyone wants to help you. Really, they do. So don't be intimidated to reach out to someone who's older and more experienced because they 100% want to help you. And, you know, just say yes more than you say no. And eventually it may not work out. Eventually it may, and it may completely direct change the direction of your life. So that's really the resources I have are community and people and reaching out because as a shy person, I didn't really reach out. I wasn't great at asking people for mentorship and stuff like that. And I've learned that it's kind of the way the world works. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Um, I think connections are really important too. And as a shy person as well, um, talking to people is actually kind of hard. So, you know, just being able to, you know, make the first step is very, very important as well. Mm -hmm. But just remember, everyone has a unique voice. So you don't have to be a certain way. You just have to be yourself because no one's going to be as good about being me as I am. And no one's going to be as good as, as being you as you are. Right. So don't try to be someone else. Don't try to be a certain way. Just be yourself and you're going to attract your right people. Your tribe is going to be attracted to you. Some people aren't going to be attracted to you, but they're not your people. You don't want to spend 90% of your effort trying to make someone who's not aligned with you, you know, like you. And that's okay. That's totally fine. Like I'm, there's a million flavors of ice cream, right? Like I'm a certain flavor, you're a certain flavor. And there's a mil- there's a lot of flavors because everybody likes different flavors. So it's all good. Yeah, I really like that metaphor. <laughs> it's true though, right? <laughs> it is true. All right. And what do you think is the vital factor that shaped your career? What was your life before learning it? And what was your life after learning it? I have a lot of discipline. So I, I highly value discipline. My son actually had a wrestling tournament yesterday and I was just amazed at the kids. Um, I'm very goal oriented. And I was also very hyper-focused when I was young. Like I didn't even want to date anyone until I was 23, until I was in medical school. So I felt like, I hate to tell this to your girls, but I just felt like boys were kind of a distraction. I mean, no offense, but they're not, you're not going to marry someone when you're like 17. So I just was very, very hyper-focused on my career very early and on athletics and anything that would get me to that career goal, because I do believe that you can diffuse your energy. You know, if you're partying, if you're, um, you know, if you're just doing other things, you can really take the energy away from, um, the channeling that you want to do to get to your career. And just say you did that for a while. And now you're 22 listening to this podcast It's not too late at all. Like super early, you know, some people, I think like Anthony Bourdain wasn't even famous until he was like 58. So there are people who, you know, don't even do anything until they're 50. So if you it's really never too late to do anything, but for me, it's diff- discipline, um, very organized and structured very early. Now I'm not so much. I, I do more like free flowing, like creative, creative kind of projects, because that's the industry like I like to be in. Um, but early on, a lot of discipline, a lot of, a lot of hard work. Yeah. A lot of grit. I mean, just, you just have to be like yesterday. I told my sonny, he's like, I'm so tired. I go, you just have to be less tired than the other guy. And then the other thing I would do is sometimes I'd see like some idiot, some idiot guy who was a doctor. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what, if that guy could be a doctor, I could be a doctor. You know, <laughs> I said it in my head. I didn't say it out loud, but like, you, it's just a matter of what you believe you can do. It just really is. Yeah. I think self-confidence is very important, especially when you're starting out your career. So And it's so important. I love the fact that in social media and platforms like yours, kids who, you know, may not have parents who have told them they can do whatever they want, because it's really how you're brought up, like whether you believe in yourself or not, you know, like my parents didn't have any money, but my, my mom also told me that, you know, she wanted success was doing what I loved. I never had they, I don't even think they knew my grades, but like, they just wanted me to do something I loved. And then, and it's kind of true. You don't have to go traditional route. You know, you don't have to go to get all these degrees. If you love something so much, you can create 
you know, a platform and you can create a business based on that thing. It's not so traditional anymore. It's just creating a new job like that never existed before. It's pretty cool the world we live in. Yeah. Okay. And my last two questions are, what's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? When I what? When you began your career. Oh, when I began. Um, oh, insurance. Okay. I'm not going to get into insurance and medical. <laughs> okay. What's one thing I knew? Oh, I know exactly the one thing I knew. This was the biggest eye-opening thing for me. So when you're in school, when you're in college, when you're in medical school, whatever you decide to do, the only person responsible for success is you. So if you you do all the hard work and you're successful, you're going to have a great outcome. It's like if A plus B then equals C, right? If you put in the hard work, you put in the time, you do the work, then you get a good reward, right? You get good grades, you get a good reward, you get good letters of recommendation, blah, 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 good jobs. When you work in the real world, <laughs> you have to depend on other people. So as a leader, as a business owner, you have to learn creative ways that motivate the people around you who often are the weakest link, right? Because if I am a great doctor and I, I have a you know great bedside manner and I take really good care of my patients, but the person in my front desk is really mean to the patients, they're not going to have a good experience, right? So there's you're more dependent on how other people are when you are outside of school. And, you know, same with any business, really, I managed a health spa in between college and med school. And I had massage therapists and, you know, other people working in, in the resort. And it's really about getting along with other people and working together collaboratively that gets things done. It's not just you anymore. So you have to be a little like, a little political, <laughs> a little understanding of different personalities and how different people are motivated so everyone can be happy. It's, 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 it's really, really a big shift. Yeah, I think that kind of goes back with the connections. You know, you got to build your relations, got to make the first step. Um, depending on others is really important as well. Right. And then, I mean, the other thing is, is like, not everyone has the same mindset. You know, they might just want to go to work and then check out and go watch TV. Or they may be like, I only want to work with you for six months and then I want to go to medical school. So you kind of have to understand where everybody's coming from in order to make a good team of people that work together. Yeah. All right. And my last question is, how do you continue to learn in order to stay on, stay on top of things within your role? Oh, well, I listen to a lot of really good podcasts. <laughs> I do. I love podcasts. Like when I'm um, doing my hair or walking around, like doing chores around the house or going for a walk or driving, I always listen to podcasts because it's different perspectives. So even if it's the same information, different perspectives will change it for me. Like, I mean, even when I give advice to patients, right. I can say it many, many ways, you know, so I like hearing how other people are so that I can learn things and then also um, learning things in different topics. So I'd say podcasts, audiobooks are really big for me. And then I go to conferences and then I like to learn new things every day because we have this part of our brain, we have neuroplasticity. So our brain is like a muscle and it can grow new, new pathways. It's just a matter of whether you want to train those pathways or not. So every year I try to learn something new. So like I learned to ski, I learned to mountain bike. I learned, I'm trying to do the piano now. It's, it's much harder for me, you know, as you get older, it's harder. And then I was going to do some languages, but Google translate kind of ruins all of that because it's just so easy to translate things that, it, you know, you miss the art of it. So I, I try to pick up new hobbies every year, as opposed to doing the same thing. And then I personally really like books and podcasts because that's how I am. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Do you want to name a few of the books that you enjoy reading? Um, well, I would say I like more philosophical and like human behavior and behavioral economic stuff. Like if I, if I was going to have like another career, it would be in like evolutionary biology. Are you familiar with evolutionary biology? Kind of. It's fascinating. It's sort of, um, how do I best explain this? It's basically how our evolutionary, the evolutionary differences between in men, men and women and how it drives us, how it conflicts with like society and how it plays its role in society. So like little simple things like, okay, here's a big issue. So a really big issue now is that, you know, our school systems are more aimed for women to succeed 
because of how we learn. Like men want to build stuff and put stuff together and that's not how our school systems are. So what's happening is more and more women are going to college and getting better paying jobs and more women are making more money than men. And that's like anti what evolutionary wants. Evolutionary wants like uh, hypergamy. Hypergamy is basically when women want to marry at or above, right? Well, there's not so many guys that are above anymore because women are exceeding men in society and in jobs. So that's where it kind of makes things difficult. Like how, how's the dynamic going to be with marriage? How's the dynamic going to be with dating and, and that sort of thing. So I, I like that kind of, that kind of stuff, but the book, I think has been the most changing book in my life is called the four agreements. And I read it every few years because I get different things about it. It's basically Toltec wisdom. And it, there's these four agreements, like don't ever make assumptions. Don't take anything personally, always do your best and be impeccable with your word, which means like, don't gossip, but also be nice to yourself. Don't say mean things to yourself. Cause we do that. Right. Like, yeah. Oh, I look fat today or, you know, something, something like that. So it's a great book. It's kind of, I'd like to say it's a quick read, but it's not really a quick read if you kind of absorb it. But I like The Four Agreements. That's one of my fave, fave favorites. There's so many good books. I mean, we could talk all day about all the books, but I, I probably most of your readers are studying too much to want to read for fun. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, do you want to say a last few words to the audience? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Jen Haley, D-R-J-E-N-H-A-L-E-Y. You could read out to me on LinkedIn and just be bold, be bright and be adventurous. <laughs> All right. Thus, that concludes episode 28. If you want to know more about how I relate to these amazing topics and stay tuned for upcoming episodes, a free way to support this show is by leaving it a five-star rating and a review on the player you're listening to. Let me know what you enjoy about this podcast as it's a chance to tell me what you love about the show and it helps others discover it too. Once again, thank you for finding me, and I hope we stay in touch with each other. Dito, you're listening to Arna Sahu, the host of Arna's News. Toodles!